Ready? Oh, yep. Okay. <clears throat> this is an interview with Richard Snyder at the Hampton Inn Carrier Circle, Syracuse, New York. Uh, it's January 16th, 2003. The interviewers are Michael Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you, you give us a, your full name and your date of birth, please, and place of birth? Yes, it's Richard <clears throat> F. Schneider, and um, place of birth, Syracuse, New York, December 19th, 1925. Okay. Uh, before you went into military service, what was your educational background? I uh, graduated from high school and uh, joined the uh, early enlistment program at the uh, Army Air Corps in November of uh, 43 and was called to active duty then January 11th, 1944. Okay, why did you select the Army Air Corps? Well, I think uh, everyone at the uh, age of 17 at that time was your young men of 17, join the Army Air Corps and win your silver wings as a pilot, navigator, and bombardier. And uh, I said, that sounds great to me. And uh, so that's why I picked the... Uh, Had you ever flown prior to that? Uh, just in, in private planes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Uh, when you heard about uh, Pearl Harbor, where were you and what... Do you remember about your feelings? I can remember that very exactly where I was at. Uh, my mother and dad's birthday both fell on December 7th. Mm -hmm. And in 1941, we were having a birthday party for them at, uh, at home. And uh, it, uh, th they ran out of some things that had to be picked up at the uh, corner grocery store. So I walked over to the grocery store to get them. And uh, I heard, they said, have you heard the radio? that the Japanese have burned, bombed Pearl Harbor. And uh, so I listened to it for a few minutes and came back home and told the folks and everyone else, they said, oh no, that's probably just a story. So turn on the radio and, and listen, and that's that's how I found out. Mm -hmm. What was your, did you have any reaction to this at all? Not really, I guess, uh, um, not knowing where Pearl Harbor was, mm -hmm. like every most everybody else, yes. I guess. Uh, didn't have much of a reaction other than, uh, you know, feeling that it uh, was a very sneak attack and, uh, and violated all the principles that we live by. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, when were you called into service and where did you, you do your basic training and so on? I called into service on January 11th, 1944 and reported to Fort Dix in New Jersey uh, for indoctrination and then ended up at uh, Biloxi, uh, Mississippi at Keesler Air Force Base. Okay, can I go back a second? Now, noticing in uh, your memoirs that you wrote, uh, you married prior to going into service? Uh, no, I didn't get married till after I came back oh, from okay, overseas. Uh, we were engaged before I went oh, to okay. service. And uh, uh, didn't get married till I came home from okay. overseas. But I had a girlfriend. Okay. Um, <laughs> Could you tell us about your training in Mississippi? Uh, Mississippi was the, at uh, Keesler Field, and uh, being kind of early in the year, it was, it was cold and uh, we lived in tents, and uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a time. Um, we went through a complete basic training and uh, included some hikes and bivouacking and uh, worked out fairly well, I thought, for me, because I, I felt I was in fairly good shape when I went into service. And with a lot of fellows that I was in service with from uh, New York City who didn't seem to be in the same, I guess, physical shape that I was, uh, the long hikes uh, were, were quite telling on them. And uh, I felt that uh, I survived that very nicely. And uh, I know one time we were in uh, bivouacking and. Uh, Everyone said, oh, we're not carrying those big, heavy overcoats with us, and, you know, we don't need all the stuff that they generally said we ought to have. So I said, well, I'm packing everything that I need. And it was a very warm day when we started. We got our pup tents pitched, and uh, it started to turn cold, and then it rained. And it poured rain for three days. And thank God I had my, uh, my overcoat with me and everything else that I had brought, because really needed it, got down to in the 40s, 
and uh, for those that didn't weren't dressed properly, it was it was quite stressful for them. What were your relationships with the, the people in uh, Mississippi, the local people? Did you ever have contact with them? We only uh, got out of the base uh, once while I was there uh, because. Uh, it was right at the time of the war where they really needed um, needed young people, and uh, they had canceled really all of the uh, cadet training for pilots, navigators, and bombardiers. And uh, we went through a series of tests, and uh, we were just told one day uh, that we were shipping out, and uh, I ended up from there at Harlingen Air Force Base. Uh, which is gunnery school in Texas, and uh, ended up uh, taking gunnery training, and uh, uh, finally ended up um, as a gunner on a, on a B-24. Um, did you train in all gunnery areas, waist gunner, belly gunner? All, all, all positions, uh, uh, including armament training. Uh, learning, learning how to load bombs and everything in planes, and uh, went flew just about every uh, type of airplane that they had, and positions of gunneries, ball turrets, tail turrets, uh, Martin turret, the top turret, and um, the uh, nose turret. How'd you like the belly turret? Well, I didn't like that as well because I was fairly tall at the time, and. Uh, to get crunched up in that little ball position was uh, was quite a problem. Uh, and, and later on in the experience, uh, when we finally joined our crew, um, I was assigned a belly gunner position, but the uh, one of the other fellows in the crew was a lot smaller than me, and uh, so he said, "Gee, I, I kind of like the belly, and if you wouldn't mind taking the tail, I you, you can have the tail. I'll take the belly." And so I said, "That sounds like a good deal to me." And uh, so that's how I ended up as a tail gunner. Now, uh, on the B-24, uh, the ball turret gunner, was he able to uh, uh, get out of there easily? I know on the B-17, uh, once those guys were in there, they were basically locked in unless uh, some, some other crew member well, cranked them out of there. Yeah, um, with the B-24, uh, the, the belly turret had to be actually let down. It was on a hydraulic ram, and it was let down so it was below the airplane. And uh, to get him out, you really had to jack the, the turret back up in mm -hmm. and uh, open his door to get him out. Yeah, so he did need some, some help from the outside. Okay, um, when were you assigned to a crew? Well, we left Harlingen Air Force Base, and uh, I was kind of hoping for a leave in between, uh, but they said, no, we just need a lot of people, and we've got to report to uh, uh, Massachusetts, to Westover Air Base in Massachusetts, and that's where I met my crew. Um, we met our, our listed people first, and then our, our pilot and co-pilot, navigator and bombardier, and uh, that's when I found that our bombardier was from uh, from Clinton, New York, and uh, so we got to be kind of close friends because we were uh, lived close to each other in New York State. Uh, we only stayed at Westover for a short time, and uh, then we were sent to uh, Chatham Field in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and that was where we would learn our uh, take all of our training for overseas. Service. Now, when you went there, did you almost all exclusively train on B-24s, or did you? All B-24s, yes, yes. Um, our pilot, of course, learned to fly B-24s there, and uh, our co-pilot did. And the navigators and bombardiers, of course, they they had all their uh, things to do uh, in the uh, the nose of the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, and we we did take all types of gunnery training uh, in the. Uh, At, at Chatham. And we did have uh, a lot of over water trips. We went to Cuba one time and uh, flew all around the eastern coast. It was quite interesting uh, to be able to see all of the places from the air uh, 
and most of the time the things we did were low level missions. What were what do you consider low level at what oh, altitude? Oh the ten thousand feet area, mm -hmm. you know, or less. Uh, especially in the George areas, coming in for runway landings and everything, we would the pilots were long, low approaches, which we learned later on that that's not the way you bring in a B-24. You bring it in high and sweep down on a on a runway very quickly and land, because a B-24 isn't known for gliding very far if something goes wrong. Um, so it was quite a quite experience uh, seeing. Seeing the swamps and everything in Georgia as we came in for landings, it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, when did you leave for uh, the European theater? Uh, in, uh, in just about the uh, end of June, early July, we left for. Um, this is 1944. Mi 1944, uh, Mitchell Field, mm -hmm. Long Island, and um, we we. Uh, we took trains up to there, and um, then we got our airplane that we were going to fly overseas at Mitchell Field. Mm -hmm. Now, was this a brand new craft? Brand new airplane, yes. Mm -hmm. And we left um, we left Mitchell Field about a week later, and um, flew to Gander Field. Well, first uh, first to Bangor Field, Maine, then to Gander Field in Newfoundland. And uh, the planes were backed up going overseas at that point, so we spent about 10 days at uh, Gander. And it was, of course, a nice time of the year then. It was, you know, uh, early July. And, uh, but the, we, were, we were anxious to get going, but spent 10 days there. And then from there to the Azores uh, for a day, uh, on from there to uh, Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Sicily. And in Italy, and we didn't know at that time where we were going. We just uh, sealed orders until we <coughs> left. Um, I think left Morocco before we knew actually that we were going into Italy. Now, what unit were you assigned when you reached? Uh, I was in the 15th Air Force, uh, the 460th Bomb Group, 763rd Squadron. Did you keep the same plane? You no, over? They actually the planes that we flew over, uh, at that time they needed so many airplanes that any airplane that got uh, to the field that we ended up at, uh, actually in Spinazzola, Italy is where our field was, um, the planes were assigned to anybody that was going to fly that day. So we never really flew in the same plane. We, we probably did, but I, I don't have any records of actually flying in a, in a specific plane at any one time. Mm -hmm. Were the planes uh, painted or were they uh, silver? Uh, some were painted when we got there, but all the planes that we had and we brought over with us were silver. Mm -hmm. So you didn't get to decorate your nose or anything? Or? Well, that, yeah, that was all done, uh, but normally the ground crew took care of that uh, and, and the different planes. And uh, there was the plane art was the, was the thing, mm -hmm. and we always liked to fly the one with the prettiest girl in the front. <laughs> But, Did you ever uh, decorate your jackets at all? Oh yes, yes, all our jackets were decorated. We with our our bomb squadron insignia was the Black Panther, mm -hmm. and uh, so that was the first thing to go on the jacket. And then, of course, the 15th Air Force emblem and uh, 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 our names and, and ranks and, and what have you. I mm -hmm. thought. Uh, did that with our jackets. Did you keep your jacket? I kept my jacket, and uh, you know, as time went on, I thought. Gee, you know, really, I don't need it. And I said to my son, do you want it? Uh, he said, well, no, not really. I, I mean, you ought to keep it. I mean, it's yours. And So I said, well, okay. And it got hung in the back of the closet, and then we moved a number of times. And uh, one day uh, he said to me, he said, what, uh, you still have your jacket? And I said, gee, I don't think so. I think your mother gave it to the Salvation Army. Oh. And he said, oh, Dad. And uh, so we... Uh, we did look around, and finally the jacket turned up, and uh, he has it now. Wow. And in fact, his daughter has worn it a couple times. Great. Yeah. I can't get into it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, why don't you explain your missions and so on out of uh, your base in Italy? Okay. Uh, out of Italy, uh, when I first got there, we were uh, said that you would need to fly 50 missions, 
and missions were um, if you took off and you went um, just a short distance that was one mission credit but if you went up deep into Germany or Czechoslovakia um, you got two mission credits so we did a lot of flying deep into Germany and I accrued a, quite a few mission credits uh, and as we got into that they changed it to 35 individual takeoffs so eventually I ended up with 57 missions and 35 individual takeoffs um, we started um, in August with 23 crews that had, had arrived at the airbase with uh, at the same time I did and of those 23 crews in um, November that year uh, there was only three operational crews left and our crew was one of them and we were minus our bombardier. Uh, our bombardier was sick one day when we were going to fly and he couldn't go with us but at that time he had become a lead bombardier and uh, that day we got shot up pretty badly and uh, coming back home we couldn't land at our base. The bases kept closing uh, due to the weather and uh, we got in to, to try to land at our base and they said it just all sucked in you can't get in here and we flew to Bari Italy and uh, the weather was so bad there they said no you can't come in you, you just can't do it uh, and we said it's just, we have no more fuel for coming in and that we, we just can't go anyplace else and uh, we crash landed in Bari and um, so we were there for about five days before we could get back to our base our plane was uh, was totaled. Um, so when we got back to our base, we found that our bombardier had flown with another crew, and uh, that crew had got shot down over uh, Czechoslovakia, and uh, uh, he had uh, parachuted out, but uh, was not heard from again. And but they did capture some of the crew, and I learned later that uh, he had evaded. Uh, through the war until the Russians had come in and liberated them at the end of, uh, as the Russians took into that area. But uh, that was just a, a, quite a story in itself. So he survived that. He survived and, uh, and moved back to Clinton, New York. And uh, in fact, when I got home from the overseas, I had called his wife. I would met her when, when we were in the service together. Uh, I met her and she I said, gee, I, I wanted to talk about uh, Bob Wicks, his name was, and she said, gee, we just got a telegram this morning that he's been liberated and, uh, and is free uh, and will be home shortly. So that was quite a, quite a nice feeling. Yes. Um, so we, we did complete then the rest of our missions. Uh, with the, I, I threw a lot, of, a lot of them with our crew. However, again, they needed so many people and, and they were short different positions on airplanes so I finished up uh, ahead of the rest of our crew because they needed tail gunners and uh, so I flew a lot more missions than they did um, to finish up earlier. Um, In uh, what you wrote there you mentioned a couple problems being a tail gunner. Yeah, um, we had gotten uh, shot up at one time I was in the tail turret and the tail turret had a uh, had a cable and you would pull the cable to open the doors or close the doors and the cable was right to the doors kind of uh, were uh, were sliding doors that swung behind me and uh, would kind of close me into the turret so when you turned your turret sideways uh, you wouldn't be out in the, the slipstream and uh, we got shut up quite badly that day when our plane started to go down and went into a uh, uh, kind of a flat spin and that pinned me right up against the side of the plane till I couldn't even move. And uh, all of a sudden, the plane seemed to, to uh, uh, straighten out of it and uh, it did recover from it. And I reached over to grab a hold of the cable to open the door so I could get prepared to be, get out of the turret and the cable come out in my hand. Uh, what had happened, the cable, we had piece of flak had come up and actually cut that cable and uh, it had cut it so that where the ammunition tracks crisscrossed underneath the turret and then I sat on top of that and the cable was was underneath that to, to toggle to go both doors when the flak came up it cut that cable 
so I couldn't get the doors open. And uh, needless to say, that was kind of scary. And uh, But one of the fellows came back from the waist and opened the door for me, and I never closed the door after that. <laughs> and I had my parachute and everything all ready, and I had shoes cabled to it so that if I could roll out backwards out of the turret, uh, pick up the parachute with the shoes attached to it, snap it on my parachute harness, and I was ready to go out of the plane. Uh, never had to bail out. Uh, had said anybody would like to bail out and just try it sometime over the base, we'd be glad to have you do it. And I said, well, if somebody said I had to do it, I'd do it. <laughs> but I just didn't uh, get to the point I wanted to do it for myself. Uh, we had another bad experience. Uh, a close friend of mine from the Syracuse area was flying a nose gunner in the uh, lead plane, and we were flying in, and flying in plane number three. Uh, and as they stack up, it's uh, three is uh, or number one is the lead plane, number two is to the right, number three is to the left, number four is low behind the the number one plane, and then six, seven, and eight uh, in their positions. We were flying in position three that day, and being the tail gunner, I could see plane number four. It was low and behind uh, uh, the lead plane. And he had runaway engines, and he went up underneath the lead plane and actually came up into the plane. And uh, they crashed together. And as they did so, the two planes came to the left and came towards us. And our pilot turned the plane so that that I was almost in stop action watching this from the tail turret. And I could see the uh, the number four plane just break apart. And then I could see the fellows standing just with their yellow May Wests that came out of the waist, just standing in midair with no parachutes or anything on. And uh, my friend I knew was in the nose turret of the other plane. Um, that plane had uh, just, the first the number four plane had just kept breaking apart. First it, it, it broke in the middle and then the tails fell off, the uh, wing came off and the engine came off and it just continued to break up. And it all kept falling towards us as, as our pilot went to the left, but it, it gave me a bird's eye view of everything happening and it, it seemed stop action and I've thought of that many, many times. Uh, the fellow that a uh, friend of mine from Syracuse, Fred Doucet, was in the nose turret, and their plane was so badly damaged that the crew heard the, the words bailout, and the pilot had actually said, prepare to bail out. So when they heard that, all they heard was the bailout, so they bailed out of the waste section of the airplane. And unfortunately, we were over the Adriatic at that time, and that was in, uh, in December, I believe it was, uh, uh, very cold, and uh, they were... They, of course, lost at sea then. And uh, Fred was jammed in the nose turret, couldn't get out. And the uh, bombardier and navigator who tried to bail out got stuck with their parachute harness and a nose wheel gear. And uh, the plane had seemed to right itself, shaking quite badly. So the bombardier and navigator, which one, called the pilot and said, well, what's it look like? And he said, well, just let's hang with it for a little bit. Uh, and they said, well, Fred's stuck in the nose turret. And, and we can't get him out. And he said, well, let's, let's stay with it for a little bit. <clears throat> and uh, so the pilot uh, said, well, let's, let's, buy, let's jettison all the bombs, jettison everything we can, keep the airplane flying. And they did finally get it all the way back to our base in Spinosola. And uh, Fred was gotten out of the nose turret and luckily uh, survived with uh, four other crew members. So those are some of the things that happened. And, uh, so a lot of other planes uh, that that were direct hits in the skies that if any of you ever shot clay pigeons uh, with a shotgun, if you uh, know that you get a direct hit, that there's nothing but a puff, well, that's how a B-24 does the same thing. It, I saw one on Christmas Day in 1944. Uh, I was flying in number four position from us. Uh, he raised up just a short distance and I, I looked at it, and then there was just a black puff, and that whole plane was just just totally destroyed. Uh, probably a, a hit directly into the bomb bays, into the gas tanks, and it was a complete, uh, 
a complete disaster. It was all gone. Uh, nobody bailed out of that. Never saw any parachutes or anything. Uh, a lot of airplanes got shot down. Uh, and as, as we, we saw planes that would drop out of the formation, and uh, then here later, either they they made it back to the uh, uh, American lines, or uh, were shot down and, and uh, captured or evades. Um, one of the other fellows I went to high school with from Syracuse, he was also in our bomb group. Um, he was shot down over Graz, Italy, or Graz, uh, Austria, and uh, he bailed out and became a prisoner of war immediately on the ground. But we never heard any more from him. Normally, we we heard when people were captured as prisoners, and uh, but he was uh, never heard from him at all. And again, when we got back to the states, um, I called his uh, family and said, you know, I, I trying to get any, any information I could get on him. And they said, well, we found out he's been uh, in a German prison camp and he's uh, been liberated and he's on his way home. And uh, he and I were great friends through junior high school and high school. His name is Bob Schlereth. And uh, I had asked my girlfriend then to marry me, and uh, uh, that was Shirley Engel. And Shirley said, uh, okay. And when Bob came home, there was uh, uh, no one else around that I knew, and uh, so I asked Bob to become our best, uh, best man. And uh, he was our best man in our wedding. We see he and his wife uh, quite a bit now. At least uh, he's still living in the same area. Mm -hmm. um, you had, again in your memoirs, you explained uh, two problems you had. Uh, something with the oxygen mask and when the others went to the bathroom in your plane? Oh, yes, yes. Um, this is something we had never heard of. <laughs> the second. Well, on the B-24 there were relief tubes. And that was a little tube that, uh, that was positioned on the side of the airplane, aircraft, and uh, every pilot had it, each pilot had one. Uh, it was up into the, uh, the command deck where the radio operator was and the, and the uh, engineer, so he could get it from the flight deck, from the flight deck anyways, and uh, a nose gunner could get out into the nose section of the plane along with the bombardier and navigator, and they all had the relief tubes, and uh, they, they went outside of the airplane. Uh, it was just a little hose that went out, fastened to the side of the aircraft. And uh, both waist positions had uh, these relief tubes. And for a long while I couldn't figure out why I, I this terrible odor that we had. And I, I thought it was my oxygen mask and that was fresh and new and it smelled of rubber and you know you could taste it and that uh, I, I just couldn't put my finger on what the smell was and finally I discovered that as the urine came out of the aircraft, it would wash along the fuselage and come up into the tail turret. So I, I said to everyone that if I caught anybody using it again, I was going to cut it off. And what I meant was the relief tube. But <laughs> Did you ever uh, fire your guns at uh, German aircraft? Uh, only once. There was a, a German JU88 was coming down through the squadron and uh, Got a chance. I, by the time I got my guns over and fired, it was gone. So I really never had a chance to fire at any 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 uh, enemy any air, any any enemy aircraft. Okay. Did you ever see uh, jets? Saw one jet uh, right at the very end of the war, mm -hmm. uh, but way off in the distance, and um, so we really never never saw other German airplanes, but never anything that was within range. And they stayed pretty much away from us. The, the B, uh, P-51s and the P-38s did a lot of cover flying for us. And uh, you could see them coming over, and I think from a, a, a ME-109 and a P-51 looked a little bit alike. And uh, so you'd see them coming and think, oh boy, is that a German aircraft or American? And so they'd normally, uh, you could tell very quick, uh, the P-51 would come over and sit right right with you to let you know that they're there. And the P-38s, they would flare up so you could see their twin booms. And uh, so that was always a just kind of a nice feeling to know that we had somebody out there protecting us. 
Now, most of the aircraft that were shot down, were they shot down by uh, fighters or, or by Mo flak? Or mostly uh, the ones that I saw were all by flak. Mm -hmm. uh, we went into uh, uh, Budapest, Hungary one day. Um, and, and going in, we were heading north, and B-17s were coming in from the north on the bomb run. And I could see they just caught one terrible, terrible day of flak. Um, uh, just, just the, you could see them getting shot right out of the air. And I thought, boy, we've got to make the bomb run, and we're going to have to f do just exactly what they did. And when we went in, uh, whether their bombs had had uh, had destroyed a lot of the enemy aircrafts or not. We got through and then not much came up at all. And what did were below us. We were flying at higher altitude than the B-17s. So uh, I think they had zeroed in on the 17s and by the time we got there we were flying higher. And uh, so we really didn't see much flak that day. Uh, but it's kind of scary to, to think of that as the, uh, you're going to have to face that in, in just a few minutes when we make our turn and get on the bomb run. Um, did not get a chance to uh, fly to uh, the Ploesti oil raids. My first mission was for Ploesti, and uh, we got halfway across the Adriatic uh, and uh, lost an engine, and then another one started to sputter, and we had a, a pilot that was training our pilot, and he said, I think we've got enough for today, we're going back to the base. So fortunately, we didn't get to go on a Ploesti mission. Now I noticed in, in there something you said that I, I hadn't really thought about previously. Um, you had to turn back from one mission because of icing. Yes. Did they ever do anything with the planes for icing? In no, no, that was never done. Uh, yeah. uh, when you got icing, you'd, you just you'd have to turn back because there wasn't there was just no other yeah. other thing you could do with it. There there were heaters on the wings that would uh, they were they were rubber covered. Um, heaters and, uh, and and they would actually flex so you could break the the ice off the, the wing tips but uh, or the wing leading edges but if you got real bad uh, icing it just just couldn't do anything with it had to turn back and try to get the lower altitude temperatures in in uh, areas where we were flying then during the winter were always around 65 below zero so uh, it was uh, it was cold and uh, so you try to get the lower altitudes sometimes to see if you could break up the ice. Mm -hmm. Now you said you had flown uh, 56 missions, was it? 57 missions, 57. actually, yes. Now how long did it take you to do that many missions? Well, I finished in, uh, you know, <laughs> memory is starting to go. Um, I finished in, uh, in April of 44, so it was uh, from August to April. You know, it's uh, seven months, I guess, eight mm -hmm. months. It was pretty, pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, they, it was all out missions. Every single day that you could fly, um, they wanted airplanes in the air. And uh, every day was an all out mission, trying to get this war over with. And uh, anybody that was available to fly would, would fly in an aircraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it just was... Uh, trying to get the war over with. Now, how long was your typical mission? Uh, several several hours? Or? Well, if we went way up into the uh, Aswisum oil, oil fields, way up into uh, uh, Hungary, and uh, uh, that would be maybe a good eight-hour trip that day. Mm -hmm. And we would eat breakfast early. Uh, normally, we would, would get a wake-up call at about uh, four in the morning and uh, go up and have breakfast, go to briefing, go to plane and do all your checkouts. Uh, I was uh, assistant armor, so I was also uh, responsible for checking the bombs and, and how they were mounted, mounted in the racks and everything, and then uh, checking all the guns on the aircraft. And uh, so, you know, you, you had a long day work out of it before you even went on your mission. And we carried um, K rations with us, uh, but we found out that if you left a K-ration out, at 65 below zero, it was immediately frozen. So I found that if I took the chocolate bars and the canned foods and stuck them in my heated flying jacket, 
that they'd stay nice and warm and uh, so I could find those to eat after we got off the bomb run. If it wasn't too bad, maybe I was hungry enough to eat. And uh, so it would uh, it kind of tide us over until we got back to the base. And uh, Red Cross was always there to uh, to give us coffee and donuts. And the medics were there to uh, give us a shot of whiskey. Um, and I never was really ready for the shot of whiskey. I, my stomach was turned upside down by then. But uh, one of the fellows that lived in our tent was a medic. So I, uh, I got all my friends together and I said to the medic, I says, bring an empty bottle and for those of us that don't drink, you can pour it into that empty bottle and we'll get that later on. <laughs> and uh, so we took that up to the sergeant's club and, uh, club and, and uh, would have that mixed up with grapefruit juice. What um, what was your reaction uh, when you heard about the death of, of President Roosevelt? Uh, I guess that was uh, you know we 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 thought we I felt it was coming, and uh, I thought uh, you know it'd be be nice if if he he could stay around to the end of the war, but uh, when it happened again, we were so busy. Um, flying missions, that the, that's what our primary thought. Uh, and I, of course, saw it sad to hear that he had died, but uh, had expected it. And, uh, you know, we were in a, in a situation where you saw death every day and you saw your friends go, and uh, so it, it uh, wasn't too, uh, didn't think too much more about it. How about your reaction to the uh, dropping the atomic bombs? Uh, at that time, I was in um, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, at uh, a base in, in, in Fort Worth, uh, when we'd heard about that, and uh, of course, quite, quite, uh, oh, I guess, uh, shocked at, at that we had such a weapon that would do such a mass destruction, but felt that, um, you know, it, it, was, it was something that the Japanese brought on themselves, they started the war, and if we had this to end the war, it was a good way to do it. And uh, when they dropped uh, the second bomb, of course, uh, uh, we said that we, th we think that's going to be the end. Um, and we're, we were pleased at the time, because it was, uh, I think we'd seen all the war we wanted to see. We saw enough people killed, saw enough of our friends killed, and um, we, we, uh, we were, I, I, felt, I felt good about it. I'd hate to see it done again, and uh, I, I hope we'll never have to. And I, I, I don't know that, that we really knew that what the devastation would, would be when the first bomb was dropped, and I think we'd already said that we're ready to drop the second one, and I, I, I don't think that they may have dropped any more. What were you, can you tell me your experiences, how you think, uh, how do you think your experiences in the service affected or changed your life? Well, I think a very positive experience because I, I, uh, I grew up an only child and uh, uh, although we were in a hard-working family uh, with good work ethics and everything, I, I, I think I didn't have the uh, opportunity to have brothers and sisters and I found a lot of camaraderie in the service and, and made friends uh, uh, and I, I think it, it broadens everyone's experience. Uh, to be in the service, to have to do things um, by by order, uh, I, I think it it, it puts some some uh, some meaning into your life. It it lets you know that you you have to you have to look and and do things um, to make to get the proper results. You have to do it in a planned way. You can't just do it haphazardly, and uh, I, I'd recommend anybody that had any time at all to spend in the service to just go ahead and do it. It's uh, it's a great experience, and I, I think it, it it teaches people that you you have to respect uh, leaders, and you have to uh, uh, learn from their experiences. And I, I think it's a, it's a great thing for anyone to join the service. 
very disappointed when I'd heard that uh, a lot of the uh, universities and colleges were uh, uh, getting rid of the ROTC and not allowing the uh, uh, the Air Force or the Army or the Marines to come into the uh, the colleges because I think uh, you know all our, our everyone I think college students included uh, should have the ability or the the availability of, of getting into a service in some way or manner, if not for a whole whole lifetime of service, but, but to get in for the year and, and, and learn what it's like. Did you uh, join any veterans groups when you returned? Yes, I did. I, I, uh, when I returned, I went to, uh, went to college, and I did join the ROTC uh, <coughs> at Syracuse University. And uh, while I was there, it was during the Korean War, and uh, so I was called back into service at that time and went to Rome Air Base, had my physical, and um, was uh, cleared to go into, uh, into flight training. And uh, I said, you'll hear from us. And I waited and never heard the war ended, and so I never had to go. But I was looking forward to going. My wife and I were uh, uh, looking to... Uh, in fact, we looked at trailers and see how, how she could follow me to where I was going. And we had a young daughter at that time, and uh, I, was, I was looking forward to it, but I was glad I didn't have to go, and I did get a chance to finish college then. Did you use the GI Bill? I used the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. Thank God for Uncle Sam. <laughs> Did you ever use the 5220 Club? Uh, no. No. I, uh, I, I didn't uh, find that as a ne necessary to use it. Although it was a great thing for, for many people, many of the veterans. Have you attended any reunions? Yes, I have. I've been to, uh, I went to our 50th Bomb Squadron reunion, and uh, I've been back twice again. This last time was in September of this year, and uh, I, met, uh, I met my co-pilot, who I hadn't seen in 57 years, and uh, I, I I could have known him as he was walking down the, the hallway. I, I saw him coming and I said, I, I know this, got to be John Castle. And uh, so we had a real good four days together. And we had our uh, nose gunner was there, uh, who was, uh, uh, he had, uh, his name was Foley, and he was a typical Irishman, had the Irish brogue, right from Brooklyn. And uh, when he finished the service, uh, was out of the service, he joined the, uh, New York Police Department, and uh, was a policeman, and I, he still has that that New York Brooklyn Irish accent, and a typical <laughs> New York City cop. <laughs> uh, I also uh, the belly gunner uh, came with his wife, and uh, so we had a good time. The four of us together. Um, I think there's only five of our crew left. All the rest of them have died, and uh, so we were we were quite glad to at least have the four of us have the chance to get together once more. And we're going to try to do it again. Now, I mentioned to you, you were in the National Guard. How long were you in the National Guard? Uh, no, I wasn't in the National Guard. I was in the, uh, I joined the, oh, uh, the reserves. Air I'm Force sorry. Reserves, okay. yes. And I was in the Air Force Reserves. Uh, I think with the active service and reserves and Merrill TC, it was about 14 years. But when I started my own business, I, I just couldn't spend the time anymore, and I had to drop out. Were you an officer at that point? I was an officer. Uh, as, uh, graduating from ROTC, I was a first lieutenant mm -hmm. and resigned from uh, the Air Force uh, as a captain. Okay. Any questions? Um, did you ever see any USO shows? Yes. Yes, I saw uh, Joe Lewis came one time to our base and I saw... Um, uh, the Lone Ranger, <laughs> and Roy Rogers and Trigger, and uh, a couple of the shows. I didn't see any name actresses, but a lot of the USO shows were, were great and, and really, uh, really good for the for the morale. Um, and I, I did. Um, trying to think, I lost the thought there. Oh, going to the USOs. Uh, camps of um, buildings in, in different cities. Uh, Naples, uh, Italy, was a great USO uh, uh, 
area to, or place to go to. And uh, they, they really helped the, the service people. Uh, being in uh, Naples at the USO Club one day, I, I met a bunch of GIs that had just come up from the front from northern Italy. And uh, we got talking and I said, boy, I just, I, I, I couldn't be you guys at all. You're out there in that mud and, you know, just cold, wet, damp, two, three, four weeks at a time and, and just in mud and water and cold. And I said, I just couldn't do that. And he says, boy, he said, I couldn't be up with you. With those guys shooting at me, and I couldn't shoot them back. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it it was good. From Naples, I did uh, get a chance to go to the Isle of Capri as, uh, uh, for a rest camp. And that was quite an experience, too. The the Isle of Capri was, uh, was, was quite a place to see. Uh, the Blue Grotto and the White Grotto were places you could see underwater. And it, just a, it was a nice break to get away from the war for a week. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Well, thank you. I hope that uh, answered some of your questions. Yes. And ask if I could send her any notes of being with, with her dad. And uh, I said, sure, I can probably do that. I had uh, my little notes that I had kept all the time in the service. And uh, so I said, I'll, I'll try to send something out. So she kept after me. And then my granddaughter said, Gee, you know, I'd like to know something about the service. So I sat down and started to write. And... Uh, my wife finally uh, gave me a hand, and 38 typewritten pages later, uh, we came up with uh, with a story, and I called it Tale of a Tail Gunner. <laughs> Could you hold that up to the... Yeah, Tale of a Tail Gunner from beginning to, beginning to end. And uh, have passed this on to uh, yes. my other granddaughter, who took it to uh, class, and uh, kind of went through uh, all of that of uh, with her class, and the uh, she even left okay. it with the teacher who said, gee, I'd love to read it, and got a good response from that. So, uh, yes. and it has totally all my experiences from the time I was uh, born until I got out of the service. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. You're welcome.